and welcome to the unknown webcast this is just a bit of a trigger warning for those who believe words are more injurious than sticks and stones i really am so conservative i can't turn left even when i'm driving mm -hmm. in addition to giving trigger warnings to our viewers ron hensel and i both drink coffee for your protection this week our guest is gregory r wrightstone author of inconvenient facts and executive director of the co2 coalition he is joining us to look, take a look at climate change, CO2, and carbon offsets. My name is Don Vino. I'm president of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc. in Wonder Lake, Illinois, which produces the Unknown Webcast. And our senior researcher is Ron Hensel, and he will introduce the sponsors of today's webcast. And here is Ronnie Baby. Greetings from sunny Florida, where the palm tree came out, saw its shadow, and now we have 12 more months of summer. Our sponsor for this edition of the Unknown Webcast is Carbona Grande Resorts and Spas, the investment opportunity of the new climate world order. Our regular legal disclaimer, our guest on today's webcast, insert name here, Gregory Wrightstone, has no connection whatsoever to any of the satirical content of the Unknown Webcast hereafter known as the webcast, although we probably will not mention it again. This satirical content includes any and all commercials, end credits, puns, smart remarks, or anything else that might fall under the definition of satire. In the meantime, Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc. bears no liability for or responsibility for anyone's opinions regarding this satirical content. Our regular announcements notice the opinions expressed on this webcast are ours and should be yours too if you enjoy it or if you just want to inflict it on someone because it annoys you. To ensure your continued access, please go to midwestoutreach.org, click the yellow donate button and continue, uh, I'm sorry, contribute as you feel led and as you do, never fear. This webcast is Y2K compliant. And don't forget to subscribe to us on your favorite video channels. And now our special guest, give a sincere welcome to Dr. Gregory Whitestone, Wrightstone, excuse me. Here we go. Welcome, 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 yes. We no longer have to fake the fake applause. We have genuine fake applause. So, welcome. Oh, good to be on with you again. We, we've done this a few months ago. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Staying really, really busy. I, I imagine you do. It's not like you're going to run out of work to do. We're trying to solve all of the climate change. You know, it's. I go back a few years. I'm. I'm not. I'm not young anymore. But I do recall back in the days of my youth when we had something called um, seasons. We don't have seasons anymore. Now we just have climate change. Mm. Well, in Chicago, in Chicago, we had two seasons. Don, we had uh, winter and road construction. Yeah, that's that's exactly that true. Was, yeah. So now and we, we still do have that. <laughs> so. So, but before we get too far into what we're actually going to be talking about today, uh, uh, Greg mentioned that he has a um, something to reveal here today that we didn't know about, and he's going to tell us about it, which mm -hmm. is first, what? First, folks. Yeah, we're, we're going to be, uh, we're debuting, it's the American premiere of a real groundbreaking movie. The movie is called Mo Climate the Movie. Uh, I've had, I've viewed a preview of it. It's outstanding. It's, it'll be must viewing for everybody watching this. Uh, it was done by Durkin. Uh, he, he had done another film about 12 years ago that was very well received. And so it's debuting tonight at the Angelica Theater in Fairfax, Virginia. We have a sold out crowd, uh, that, that are coming to view the movie tonight. Uh, and I picked uh, with Dr. John Clauser will be introducing the movie. And if you don't know that name, he's the 2022 Nobel laureate in physics. Um, and he famously has stated quite often that uh, there is no climate crisis. He calls it a, uh, a crop of crap. I guess I'm allowed to say that here. Mm -hmm. It's clean yeah. up language. And uh, that's well, what that's a scientific it. term anyway, isn't it? Yeah. Right. And he will be saying that tonight. Uh, I took him up the airport Sunday, and he he gave an hour presentation yesterday at our offices. Uh, so Dr. John Clauser, 2022 Nobel laureate, 
In fact, he was honored at the White House uh, last spring. And afterwards, he talked to Joe Biden and, and he says, well, just be aware that I believe that the science that you're using for energy and climate's wrong. And Joe Biden says, oh, you're just spouting right wing science. So, uh, <laughs> Oh, I didn't know there was right-wing science. Yes, <laughs> I didn't know I do. Uh, hard, so, to, hard, to, hard to call the Nobel laureate in physics a science denier. Well, yeah. he, he, it's right-wing, but he he denies left-wing science. He doesn't deny right-wing science. So, you know. Yeah. Uh, so we'll be we'll be doing that tonight, and then we'll be going live on Thursday on uh, March twenty-first uh, to be viewed on either dozens of various streams rumble youtube um and it, it'll it, we're, we want to blow this thing up uh on march 21st march 21st first day of uh what we used to call spring what do we call it now uh, her, uh you know. summer solstice oh but it's june 21st right oh no that would be spring equinox right? yeah the spring equinox but it, it can't, yeah, everything's but been messed up by equinox. climate change yeah it has in fact oh. Yeah, Joy asked me today, when, when is when is spring actually start? Because we always thought it was March 21st. And then she's just reading something and says, well, it could be between the 19th and the 21st. It depends on where you live. And I'm going, this is just too weird for me. I, now they don't even know when, <laughs> when it's going to happen. <laughs> I think, uh, I think in, on the woke calendar, it's, it's the white exploitation of nature season. Or something like yeah, that. Exactly. You know, yeah, exactly. That sounds probably right. Which is interesting yeah. you say that. I don't know if uh, Greg was aware of this, but we I was just up at Paganicon 2024 in Minnesota, a little area we call Paganistan. There's about 25,000 pagans all live up there. Uh, and um, it was in Plymouth, Minnesota. And there's uh, probably a 1,000 witches, Wiccans, pagans, druids of all types all believe in climate change so <laughs> so there's well, a lot too. of pardon I, I do too i mean it is it is the, our climate is warming that's a fact it just is right. yeah, uh, okay. but that, that warming started more than 300 years ago uh, and we really didn't start adding much co2 to the atmosphere until the mid of the 20th century so the first 200 to 250 years of of the warming trend we're in had to be entirely naturally driven. And so what, what you're being told is that, well, that's true. We had 200 years of warming, but that, that all changed around 1950. And now it's all driven by uh, man's emissions of, if you'll forgive me, it's our sins of emission of CO2. <laughs> of emission. <laughs> okay, so, let's use that. Now, here, here's something I just like to briefly touch on, because when you get into these debates between scientists, one of the things that eventually comes up, usually from lay people, I, I don't know that I've ever heard it from a specialist in any field, is, well, if you're not a climatologist, you really don't know anything about this. So here's the thing. Now, I, I look at the hard sciences and I say, you know, there are some hard sciences that are really hard, you know. I mean, when I'm using a little equivocal language here, but, you know, Dr. John Clauser, he, he won his Nobel Prize in physics for experiments with entangled photons establishing the violation of Bell inequalities and pioneering quantum information science. Now, that's hard, hard science, right? So would you say... It's hard to even say it. I mean, it's hard, you know, I have to go now. I remember, I know what quantum means in, you know, general terms. I, I probably heard of bell inequality somewhere or sometime but what i'd like to know from you now your specialty again is geology geology okay so they well, would look at you and they would look at dr clauser and you you haven't even won a nobel prize so you're not even as good as as uh what's his name the guy who invented the internet al gore yeah uh but you're not even as good as him because he won at least won a nobel prize uh, so you know the, the the lay people they look and they say you know you don't have that specialty therefore you're not equipped and then on the other hand before i get to my point on the other hand uh they'll they'll look at this long list of scientists who signed who signed all these documents in favor of global warming and they won't point out the fact that hardly any of them are climatologists maybe one out of right. ten 
right? And yet they're weighing exactly. in. So as long as you weigh in on the right side, you don't have to be a climatologist. When you weigh on the wrong side, uh, you you have to be a climatologist or you're discounted. So my next question, this is my whole point, how hard is it for a geologist or a, a physicist to look at the climate evidence and evaluate it based on their training? Well, the, the, as a geologist, we look at the long, the rock history. We look at Earth's history, the long, long view. Uh, but just bear in mind, there was no, no such thing as a climatologist 30 years ago. This is all a, Good a, new, a new instruction. Uh, and we, we look, and there are probably 30 separate sub-disciplines that all feed into this. For example, our, our chairman at the CO2 Coalition is Dr. William Happer. Uh, uh, Dr. Richard Lindzen was, was a former board member here, but they're both uh, probably top experts in radio, and they're physicists dealing in radiative transfer and the interaction of of the energy from the sun and molecules and how that excites the the water vapor atoms, the CO2 atoms, the methane atoms, and how that all relates to, to warming. And they all from, they'll, they'll they say, well, he's not a climate climate scientist. Well, that's what global you know, greenhouse warming is driven by the physics of the atmosphere. And they're they're the top experts. And we look at people like me, we look at the long record of temperature and carbon dioxide and then compare that to what we see today. Um, and, and you need that long record. Uh, so we, we, we use all sorts of sub-disciplines. Uh, historians are part of this discussion of climate change, historical documentation. You know, where were the, where were the olive groves uh, in 1653, how far north were they? We can we can take historical records to, to learn a lot about the climate. Uh, so, so there are all these sub-disciplines that all need to blend together and to tell the story of the of the history of our climate. And we can do that going back hundreds, thousands, mm -hmm. and even millions. Of years. So, as a as a geologist, are you able to? take off your geologist hat. You, you, you don't have a climatologist hat to put on, but you, you turn and you look at this like a technical paper on climate. You have sufficient background to be able to look through that and evaluate, to, first of all, understand the data as it's being presented. If there are any, if there's any math in it, understand the math and just kind of evaluate from your own. Well, you, have to understand, you have to understand the, the physics. And I, I'm not a physicist. And there are very few people that actually, uh, the papers that our physicists have written, particularly Dr. William Lins Linsen, or Linsen, uh, Win Dr. William Wingard and Napper, dealing with, this is deep, deep physics that very few, very, very few people can actually understand. Uh, and when, when I see other papers with the physics, I'm not going to try and interpret that myself because I'm just, I don't have the, I don't have the, uh, I, I'm not wired that way. I don't have it. Very few people are. But what I do have are experts on our team, and I can present it to them, mm -hmm. and they can take a look at it for me and say, you know, here, this is where they got it wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I'm not going to, you know, that that's the value we have here at the CO2 Coalition. With it. We have this team of of experts on almost every uh, aspect of this. In fact, we've just got a I just received the final ver. Well, we're, we're going through editing of uh, CO2 and nutrition. Uh, it's a paper that's very much needed. And it's incontrovertible that more CO2 is driving plant growth and hence crop productivity. You can't argue it. There's no dispute. It's, it's so clear and overwhelming that uh, agricultural production is being driven by both primarily CO2 increases, but also by warming temperatures. It's, it just is. And he, nobody can say it's not because it's, is, right is, the, it's, is the tree line moving North in Canada? Yes. Yes. I, I mean, it's, this, I heard this back in the nineties. I, I, I heard an interview on NPR, a climate scientist. I mean, this is before everything got hysterical and like doomsday ish. And they were interviewing this this climate scientist and he said well you know there's there's a positive side to global warming we're going to be able to grow more crops in the northern latitudes and feed more people so if you might say global warming is coming along at just the right time yeah 
if you look at Dr. Tim Ball, who's the late Dr. Tim Ball, great uh, Dr. Tim Ball, uh, his paper catalog that in Canada, the tree lines moved about 100 kilometers further north. Wow, that's big. That's millions of square miles. Yeah, but that's that's what you get in a warming environment. We get tree lines uh, moving up into the higher latitudes, uh, farther up higher altitudes on the mountains. So with apologies to Jimmy Buffett, it would be changes <laughs> in latitudes, changes in altitudes. Well, so, on, uh, on the downside of that, we're releasing all of that trapped methane in the tundra, in the frozen tundra, and it's going to destroy the planet, right? Yeah, that's what, that's what you're being told. That's just not so. <laughs> uh, we, we, are, we also did, uh, Dr. Lindsay and Happer uh, did a paper on methane and climate, just documenting. I mean, n- number one, greenhouse-driven warming from carbon dioxide is terribly, terribly low. It's, it's, it's not entirely inconsequential, but neither is it a, a big driver of temperature changes. Uh, their best estimate using actual physics is that a doubling of CO2 will lead to maybe seven-tenths of a degree of warming. Of, uh, and that won't occur. A doubling from 400 to 800. Actually, we're at 420, so it'll be 840. And that won't occur for 150 years. And uh, I think we can deal with seven-tenths of a degree of additional warming. Yeah, but, but think how much tax money they can extract from us between now and 100 exactly, years right. from now. Yeah. I mean, yeah. why should we pour a, all the, you know, pour a bunch of water on that parade, you know? Well, um, it's... This is what they're doing. What they're doing is fomenting and pushing an anti-human agenda. It's what they're doing. It's it's uh, it'll be an incredibly economic destructive. And what they're doing for the agricultural sector, if they go through with what they want, it's going to be it'll be horrific. Uh, again, another paper written by us last year predicted uh, millions of deaths due to famine and starvation. Uh, uh, we don't have to do that. And that's what they're inflicting on us. Because uh, let's just take a look. What's driving this global output and global increase in crop productivity? And it is in my new book, uh, which was just published. It's right. a very convenient, a very convenient warming um, that's available now. Uh, in my new book, I capture there's a, 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 the, the the huge benefits that are accruing to humanity. And the subtitle is uh, how modest warming and more CO2 are benefiting humanity. And as a Christian, uh, the church is a Christian broadcast, and you should celebrate that. Yeah. The benefits that are accruing to our, to our, our sons, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren, and humanity all across the planet are benefiting from warming and more CO2. And why, why is why is warming so important? And that's because there, there are two, two ways to look at this. Number one, warming means the growing seasons are lengthening. Uh, in the continental United States, growing seasons have lengthened by more than two weeks since 1900. Really? What does that mean? Filling frosts stop earlier in the spring and arrive later in the fall. Uh, and you get yeah. more plantings in. Yeah, but... Isn't it true that if there are just like uh, the world would be a whole lot more enjoyable for everyone if there just weren't any people here? I I, I just talked to a gentleman yesterday who was telling me that that we we have way too many people on Earth. But again, just in my new book, all, and everybody, and everybody would enjoy the place. You know, you no, know, it's just not so. But again, in this new book, a very convenient warming, I document and, and capture. I compare crop productivity versus population growth, and we're way outpacing. The crop productivity is significantly outpacing uh, population growth. So we're feeding a growing population, and with this with this excess, but let's go back to the warming and how it affects temperatures. Uh, for example, if you've got if you're living in Ohio or Michigan and you've got a crop, you've got an apple orchard. What do you fear the worst? You fear a late spring killing frost, don't you? Because that could just ruin that could right. ruin your season. And because of warming, there are 
the chances of that happening are much less. Um, and so also, again, looking at temperature warming versus cold, the, the middle, the, the book I, I just wrote is in three sections. The center, the middle section, second section is one of my favorite subjects. It's a strong relationship between uh, human history and climate history going back thousands of years. And if you look going back to the first great civilizations, uh, the Hittites, the Babylonians, uh, the Assyrians, the Harappan Empire and the Indus River Valley, all of these great civilizations, the first great civilizations rose up in what was known as the Bronze Age or the Minoan Warm Period, which is much, much warmer than it is today. And we know it was warmer because they were growing, for example, historical records tell us that they were growing a crop called millet in Scandinavia. Well, yeah. It grow millet, except in subtropical and tropical areas. Well, it had to be a lot warmer. Uh, and then it started getting cold. And all of those great civilizations collapsed within 50 or 100 years. And it's, the, it's, it's pretty well recognized. Historians recognize that it was related to that cooling period. It was called the Late Bronze Age Collapse. So, and it, uh, so I don't just, never... let, me, let me just finish up. Yeah, here. Each one of these cooling periods was associated with crop failure, famine, pestilence, and mass depopulation. And we see that regularly. Warming is good, food is bountiful, cold is bad, and it leads to mass depopulation. So the Bronze Age ended, I'm, try, I'm trying to remember when that ended, um, about 700 BC, right in SMIC, they're saying online here that it goes from 2000 to 700 BC. Right in the middle of that, there's this, the, the year 1177, is cited as a time when civilizations throughout the Mediterranean just collapsed. Yeah. Are you familiar that was, with that? Yeah, that was that was the late, late Bronze Age collapse. I'm trying going through my book here to get. Yeah, so the Bronze Age. Uh, I don't know if those know, in warm period to 1200 BC. It started the Greek Dark Ages started in oh. 1200 BC. And, and that was related. That was that was the collapse. Uh, of all those civilizations. So something happened, according to these people, 23 three years later, where all of these, uh, and apparently it had to do with these huge population shifts. Uh, it was with the population, there were what were called the sea peoples. Yeah, that, yeah. That's the, the sea peoples invaded about the same time as this cooling, but the, they, they didn't, they sure didn't help things, uh, but they didn't cause all six or eight great empires to collapse at the same time. Uh, this was all, they, they were, were probably, they were probably driven by climate change to go. Climate there refugees, so to speak. Well, they were like, it's like the, uh, we just bought a new home in Florida. And I, so we're being in, Florida is being invaded from people from the North. Nope. Nobody's moving to Wales, are they? <laughs> you know? Not lately. Well, you know, moving to Wales. Like uh, and no, we're moving to Florida, Texas, Tennessee. People like it warm. We're we're creatures uh, of the tropics. And it was only when we developed clothing and fire uh, that we could get escape the tropics and stay warm enough to survive. And it was only when we invented mosquito repellent that we could reverse that and come down here. And air conditioning too that helps. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Yeah, you're right. Um, so the so the climate has impacted human existence and migration patterns and civilizations for eons for recorded history. We're probably in a better. We've never been in a better position to adjust to it to cope with it than we are now, and yet we've never been more scared of it. Never been more alarmed about it. And never, never, never uh, assumed that we can somehow control it, that we can somehow do so. You know, it's like uh, Mark Twain said: everybody complains about the weather, nobody does anything about it. Uh, well, now we're at a, we've we've kind of gone beyond that hubris that he made a joke about. We now think we can do something about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which brings me now for for me to interrupt for a second on on like three points. One is climate change. The movie you said is going to be live streaming starting the 21st. Is there some place we can direct people to go to find out where's live streaming at? 
um, I'm I'm meeting the producer uh, just after we finish this interview, and I'll be getting. I'm trying to find those details myself. Okay, uh, if you could email that to me, then we could suggest, broadcast that out as well. Yeah, I I'd suggest anyone watching this go to the our website co2coalition.org right. co2coalition.org and subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, we don't overwhelm you. We put one out a week, uh, our newsletter, and I guarantee, guarantee that <laughs> it will be informative and entertaining and that you'll read our newsletter and you go, huh, I didn't know that. Isn't that interesting? And so I, I hate getting huge amounts of newsletters from people that, that are Please send us money. You know, we need you. You know, we're yeah, gonna, yeah. Our, you know, we don't do that. Our goal and our mission is to inform uh, our members and our subscribers. And for example, we just sent out our newsletters today. Newsletter today was on CO2 and food. And again, yeah. relate with some of the impressive charts. One of the charts I sent out today was the relationship of corn. In the United States, corn is the, is the, greatest crop that's been produced in the world the united states is the is the number one by far producer of corn for export and consumption and if you look at, if you look at this chart that shows crop growth in terms of bushels per acre versus carbon dioxide and versus temperature man they're just marching in lock lockstep uh, the only thing i didn't add were the contribution of nitrogen fertilizer uh, but again it warming more CO2, nitrogen fertilizer, all of these are just uh, driving crop growth. I also, in the newsletter today, I showed a chart of the top eight crops in the world uh, by weight, by tonnage that are produced. All eight of those are just breaking growth records nearly every year, and it's increasing, and there's no end in sight. That's because we're adding CO2. CO2 mm -hmm. is the, we, 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 we don't have enough CO2. We don't have too much. We don't have enough. Right. Plants haven't right, reached. and they're trying to reduce it. Yeah, but yeah. not just that. They want to get rid of nitrogen fertilizer. It's right. estimated. It's hard to assess, but probably around thirty percent of the increases in crop growth since 1950 are due to the use of nitrogen fertilizer. And these people are trying to reduce it. They say, "Well, it's causing uh, pollution. It's causing nitrous oxide to be produced." Uh, in some cases, yes, uh, but we can look back. Just two years ago, Sri Lanka, the president there, President Rajapaksa in, in Sri Lanka, uh, he was he bought into this whole theory of nitrogen's bad, uh, natural is good. We need to have organic agriculture. And Sri Lanka is an agricultural based economy, and he banned it. And almost immediately, within within nine months, their entire economic system collapsed. Their agriculture went to uh, nothing or close to nothing. People revolted, uh, marched in the streets. He barely escaped the presidential uh, palace by the skin of his teeth and fled to India. And it was because he banned nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, and how do you make nitrogen fertilizer? With fossil fuels. It's made mainly from natural gas. Uh, mm. And so they're, what they're, it, we, we have a case study of what happens if we look at Sri Lanka, what happens when we get rid of nitrogen fertilizer? Uh, agricultural output plummets. Well, the good part of that is, is that the people who uh, instigate or institute those policies will eventually be driven out of office by the mobs, the very mobs that they were pandering to to begin with, I think. Well, but it, they, they can do a lot of damage until oh, yeah. what's going on with the current yeah. administration and how the, uh, the current administration's doing a lot of damage right now. Yes, and we, we need to stop them. They're trying to control every aspect of your lives, everyone watching this, from what, what we drive, how we heat, uh, how we cook, uh, how much water goes right. out of your if, shower head. If we, if we can grow food in our backyard. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, they, I mean, I think the whole goal here is that we're all going to be having Soylent Green for dinner uh, eventually. So, so, so that kind of brings me to my second thing, which I am glad you corrected me in the beginning because we do believe in climate change. It's not a matter of does the climate change, is it changing? It is always changing. The question is how much do humans right. control the thermostat of the planet? Right. Right. 
that's well, to me a lot of hubris to make that claim. Well, and we we do that as a geologist. That's where I come in. We can look at over the last, for example, during this we're in an ice. We're still in an ice age, believe it or not. And over hmm. the last eight hundred thousand years, it's warmed and cooled. These are brought on hundred thousand year cycles. Really? We're in an interglacial period right now that's warm. Thankfully. My wife, my wife believes you. She she thinks we're in an ice age. It's never too warm for her. So <laughs> yeah, that's good. But but uh, if even even in this warm period, Ren, we're still colder than most of Earth's history by a lot. And uh, what we see is that when it the big driver of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are the oceans. And when the oceans warm, they expel carbon dioxide. And when they cool, they suck it up, which is a little counterintuitive. Because as you think, if you're, if you have, if you heat up water and add sugar to it, we the hotter it gets, the more sugar you can add. But it's just opposite for carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is expelled. Just think about if you have an, a liter jar of ginger ale and you take it out of the refrigerator and you open it up and it just goes, and that's it. Well, take that liter jar of ginger ale and put it on your, on your table and on your patio in the sun in August and let it sit there for two hours and then open it up, what happens? It's like a volcano exploding. That's the CO2, the carbon dioxide, that's being expelled from the ginger ale. And the same thing happens with with our oceans. Uh, and so during these the really cold ice advances, uh, CO2 is locked up into the oceans. And so actually over the last, we know over the last several hundred thousand years, temperature changes have preceded CO2 changes. But again, we're told, being told now, oh, no, 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 it's all changed. And CO2 is driving temperature. Uh, but that's not what history tells us. Uh, and, and what's, okay, we've in, increased carbon dioxide. It's at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we were at 280 parts per million. Today, we're at 420. That's a 50% increase in atmospheric CO2. What is the reason? Why has it increased? It's our emissions of CO2. And it's mainly fossil fuels. And I'm okay. I'm, in fact, I'm beyond okay with that. I'm very thankful that we are adding so much CO2 to the atmosphere. And we should continue doing that. Hmm. Uh, at the end of the last ice age, uh, the last ice advance 18,000 years ago, our levels of CO2 became dangerously low. And, and why do I say dangerous? Because it got down to 180 parts per million. At 150 parts per million, all plant life is gone. Oh boy, that's, that's what I call the line of death. And we nearly got to that line of death in the recent geologic past. Uh, so no more CO2. We're actually uh, we're in we're in CO2 star starvation. Uh, we're impoverished. CO2 impoverished right now. Huh. Uh, plants and the entire ecosystems thrive with the current higher CO2 levels. But again. More, more carbon dioxide is hugely beneficial. Huh. So, but there, are, in the midst of all of this, there are um, investment opportunities that some may be not thinking about. Yeah, and you know, uh, they're kind of connected to this topic. I mean, like when you see images like this, what do you think of? Uh, vacation fun, relaxation, time away from the family, with the family, <laughs> with the family, yes. Well, here are two words you should be thinking. Cha-ching. Because any day now, maybe any minute now, the Arctic beaches of North America, Greenland, Northern Europe, and Asia will all look like this, making them the investment opportunity of a lifetime. Work will soon be starting on our new chain of Carbona Grande resorts and spas. Contact Oxcore Industry today for a free investment perspective at 1-800-CLIMATE. So when the rest of the world looks like this, you can look like this, thanks to Carbona Grande Resorts and Spas. Check it out. So, um, you know, we got to make money somehow. Uh, this is where all the this is where all the real investment is happening. What's, uh, why don't we Why don't we talk? You showed some pictures of some tropical isles. Let's talk about sea level rise. Yeah, um, that's the big bugaboo, isn't it? That we're being told that uh, islands around the in the Pacific, the Caribbean. Uh, the Indian Ocean will all be underwater within a few decades. Hey, because Florida, according to Neil deGrasse Tyson, 
this whole state, this whole peninsula at least is 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 uh, submerged. Yeah, and well, let's take a look at that. According to the UN, they've listed some eighteen or twenty uh, most at-risk islands and, I, and island nations, and the Maldives in the Indian Ocean are, is the most at-risk of all the island chains. The highest point's fourteen feet above sea level. Okay, well, at this. 15,000 years ago, the Maldives were also just above sea level. In the last 15,000 years, yeah. sea level has risen 400 feet. Why are these islands not under 400 feet of water? Yeah, really, why not? Because of a geologic process known as accretion. These islands grow as sea level rises the, during storm events. It's the nearshore gravels and sands are swept up onto the island. You don't think it's a long-term process, but geology is a slow long-term process. Uh, and so as these, what, and so what they're telling you, now bear in mind, sea levels are currently rising at seven inches per century. That's not too alarming to me. Uh, and so what they're telling you is, well, by the year 2050, according to the current rate, sea level would have risen two inches, barely to your ankles. So what they're telling you is the last 400 feet of sea level didn't put those islands underwater, but that next two inches, look out. <laughs> well, that, those next two inches are going to get the Maldives a lot of UN relief assistance, aren't they? Oh, yeah. They're they're all standing there with their hands <laughs> out. Paying, Amy, I mean, it's paying. all about money. This really is all about money and control. Yeah. Uh, but you said something really interesting. I don't think I, I don't I don't want to I, I want to let this sink in as as uh, Elon Musk recently said, let this sink in. I should have brought a sink to illustrate that. Uh, <laughs> the, the the common narrative is ra uh, rise in CO two levels leads to rise in temperature, which means that the rise in CO two level kind of only incidentally just so happens to also increase plant growth. That's just another side effect, but we have to be worried about, you know, the increase in temperatures because of all these other things, storms and, you know, sea level rise and all that. But what you said was his history, the history shows that it's reversed, that rise in temperature leads to an increase in CO2 level by releasing it from the oceans, which then supercharges or, you know, charges up plant growth, which then feeds people, just, you know, that's people, you know, yeah. are they really necessary for the enjoyment of the planet? I mean, can't we just get along without them? But well, I, will, I will say right now, though, things are a little bit different because we're doing, there's an unusual change in the atmosphere that's never, that we're, it's because of us and our emissions. So we've, we've raised CO2 levels from what they normally are during each of the interglacial interglacial warm periods like we're in right now, CO2 usually got to 280, maybe 300 parts per million. But again, we're up to 420 and we're 50% higher CO2 than what the other similar interglacial periods were. So that additional CO2 does provide some warming to the atmosphere. Okay. Uh, well, I have to admit, I have, been eating, I have been consuming a lot more beans lately. So uh, if that is, if it would help if I cut back on that, maybe the whole planet will thank me. Mm, uh, yeah, your wife would. <laughs> <laughs> so or maybe the grandkids so, too. So you think we account for how much of that increase from two eighty to four twenty parts per million? Well, nearly all, nearly oh, really? all. And it's, okay. Yes, yes, absolutely. We and we can do that by looking at a a simple mass balance equation of of co2 so we're actually we know pretty closely how much co2 we are emitting how man's co2 emission we know pretty closely what that is and we know very accurately uh the co2 levels in the atmosphere and what we find are that we're emitting twice as much co2 into the atmosphere as what shows up really what shows up in the atmosphere and, and so you have to ask well what happens to that other amount of CO2? And the answer is it's being naturally sequestered or taken out of the atmosphere by natural processes, primarily increased vegetation growth. Yeah. Uh, that it's sucking the CO2. Um, a lot of it is just uh, it, some of its photosynthesis in the ocean. Oceans are sucking some of this up. Um, if you go to uh, the creation of limestones, corals and things like that, 
Uh, if you go down to uh, Miami and you, you see the beautiful white beaches, well, that's not sand. It's sand-sized particles, but it's not quartz sand like you would get in New Jersey. These are these are calcium carbonate, tiny little things called oolites, sand-sized oolites. And that th those oolites are created by, uh, again, it's calcium carbonate, and they use the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere uh, to create these limestone sands that are down at Miami in the Keys. Uh, and so that create that takes lots. This is happening worldwide, uh, this continued creation of limestone on our on the ocean floor. Really? So we've got limestone creation, huge amounts of vegetation sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere. And again, the, the oceans uh, taking some of it, a lot of it, the, for example, algal blooms that we see in the oceans. Now, uh, take I take a huge amount. I've got this crazy idea. Just hear me out here. Could all of these self-balancing um, occurrences in nature, could it possibly be the way God designed the planet? Maybe? <laughs> I mean, just I'm just throwing it out there. What a concept. Well, it, it, uh, you would like to think so, but it, it didn't self-balance for many millions of years because we got down to near, we've had been declining CO2 levels for a really, really long time. Um, and plants have been starved. Uh, for CO2 for a very long time. And it's it's only recently due to our emissions that uh, plants are now starting to flourish again. So, uh, so could that somehow be like part of God's plan though, maybe that we would we would just start doing that thing just as our population was increasing and we had the need for it? I'm, I'm not going to second guess anybody and what, what, what the plan is going to be. But I can tell you that what we are doing is not harming. That's the key here is we're not harming the planet. Yeah. Uh, if we were, then it would be it would be on us to stop doing what we're doing. Yeah. And right. if we could prove and just say what I'm doing is horrible and it's going to kill millions of people, then yeah, we should stop doing it. But we're not. We're, we're seeing our huge benefits. We're seeing that forests. We don't see deforestation. We see reforestation. We see the deserts are shrinking, not expanding. Where crop productivity is expanding, forest fires are decreasing globally. Um, it, it, just really? one thing after not, Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the uh, the, the the satellite, the Pernica satellite, uh, went up here some 18 years ago, and and with that they were able to measure global acreage burn. And I, again, I capture that in my book, a very convenient warming as I get put on my sales hat. And uh, <laughs> and so if we if you look at that globally, acreage burn is declining. We see that in the United States, the continental United States, the, the, both the acreage and number of fires are 20 percent of what really? they were in the 20s and 30s. Absolutely. So could this so could then there be some truth to the rumor, some truth, maybe that the reason California has such a problem with fires is because of their really very poor forest management practices. It, well, if you look at if you look at the website uh, for NIFC, which is all things fire related, you know, their, their graph starts in 1983, and they have the y-axis expanded. So it looks like this terrible increase in fires. Uh, but what they they don't show is the data before 1983. They need to hide that data that goes back to 1926. They need to hide that, and then. Focus on why 1983? Because remember, that was the those were the Clinton years. Remember the spotted owl. We you shut down all the law. 83 or 83? 83. 83. 83 is Reagan. Well, whatever. It was 1980. <laughs> no, well, that would have been Reagan. And uh, but in, in the 80s, they shut down logging in the forest. And that's where when things changed. Forest management stopped. Um, yeah, just let all the, just let all the 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 uh, tinder just collect on the surface of the floor of the forest and who knows what will happen. Well, the, the, the Sierra Nevada Conservancy tells us there are four to five times too many trees per acre on the federal properties. And what does that mean? That means there's more, any fire is going to be more intense. There's more fuel to burn, but hmm. think about, about that too. With more trees per acre, each one of those trees is competing for the same scarce soil moisture. Uh, with the other trees so that the more trees are actually leading to an increase in aridity and and drop in soil moisture which exacerbates the problem then think about this too 
all the logging roads that they used to be able to access if there was a fire that sprang up uh they could mm -hmm. they could take their trucks that they need to get there and go out the logging roads and get there well they're all grown up now they're beyond saplings or trees grown up across there and the only way to access this now is to airdrop these firefighters in and so all these things compound too many trees which means intense fires too many trees increase in aridity no way to get to the fire when it first starts uh and they don't they stop doing controlled burns uh to clear out forest right. management if you look in, in oregon and california and washington most of the big fires recently are on federal united states forest properties not private lands because the private lands are handling a forest management pr pretty well it's the it's the united states forest lands that are, are are being the real problems and that could not have possibly just a little bit of something to do with politics could it yeah it has to <laughs> you would think that it has to do with people going back to nature. We're just, nature is good. We just have to let it, you know, we just need to get out of the way. Uh, and we saw how terribly that's gone wrong with forest management. Uh, yeah. The other, the other one of the big problems in the West uh, is invasive species known as cheat grass. Uh, a lot of these fires, maybe more than half of the fires in the West are actually grass fires uh, that are fueled by this cheat grass. And it, they call it cheat grass because it cheats out the other, grasses that are native because it comes out earlier in the spring and it crowds out those others and so now we've got this real problem with vast amounts of cheat grass mm -hmm. and just think about this dried grass all it takes is a spark of any kind right and then right. it goes up so when i said it couldn't have a smidge to do with politics i probably should have said ideologically driven politics in other words yeah. the real problem is the ideology your politics can be driven by that or it can be driven by facts. You know, you can, you can, if your politics is driven by facts, it's more flexible. It can adjust more quickly. It can pivot when it needs to. When it's adjust, when it's attached, when it's anchored to ideology, the facts don't matter. All that matters is the ideology. So, yeah. So I, I want to go back to one something else <clears throat> that we were going to touch on, which kind of is what started this whole discussion. To get started anyway is uh an article i read about a month ago was kind of uh picking on taylor swift for her <laughs> carbon offset purchases toward the end of last year they write the multiple granny grammy winning artist was called up for allegedly racking up 138 138 tons of co2 emissions in her private jet over just three months including flights to see Kelsey while he was, she was touring in South Africa. So then they pose this question, is carbon offsetting defense good enough? Uh, Joe Dar Darden, uh, the director of aviation at Transport and Environment, thinks not. Taylor Swift's offsetting won't be able to shake off her terrible carbon footprint. Uh, she says, offsetting is a fake solution in times of climate crisis we can't allow super rich to continue flying, et cetera, et cetera. So tell me about carbon offsets. Is it a fake solution? And if it's a fake solution from your standpoint, it's a fake solution from their standpoint for a different reason. Well, I, I'm going to push back on a couple of fronts. Number one, yeah. a solution to what? Yeah, yeah. They're assuming <laughs> right off the front. They're, they're assuming that there's a crisis that needs to be solved. They're, they're assuming there's a problem that needs solved with that question. And they're flat out wrong. There is no climate crisis. There's no, we don't have to solve a non-existent problem. Uh, what we have is a, is a thriving, prospering planet and an improvement of the human condition. Uh, and yeah. our, if you're going to talk about buying carbon offsets, uh, it, a lot of this has to do with uh, forests. They're, 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 they're paying people money to grow trees. Well, what happens when you do have a forest fire and those things burn up? Uh, that carbon that you've just offsets goes straight into the atmosphere. Uh, they're also doing carbon off offsets, carbon capture, direct air capture out of the atmosphere. And then it's called sequestration underground. Uh, these are horribly expensive uh, procedures. We I just got back from Wyoming. We spent a week there with uh, Dr. William Happer and our team, 
uh, fighting back against Republican Governor Mark Gordon's uh, proposals to decarbonize Wyoming and the West by using carbon capture and sequestration. And it's 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 just horrible. And it's, it's an economically uh, terrible, I was going to say solution, but there I would get in trouble. <laughs> but, but again, they're, they're talking about spending trillions of dollars to get the net zero. Uh, I would say we shouldn't spend trillions. We shouldn't spend one red cent. We should not spend one penny. If, if there isn't a crisis and things are getting better, get out of the way. Exactly. Just let it happen. It's. It, I mean, it, things are going really, really well. How long do you think it'll take? I mean, I, I'm assuming that we're gonna at some point see a paradigm shift, a kind of a Cunian, you know, the evident, you know, the, the, we have we're working with this one paradigm now. It is the reigning paradigm, but as evidence mounts up that causes problems, eventually you see a shift. Uh, maybe I should ask first. Do you see that? in the sciences coming. Uh, maybe it could be pushed along by the economic hardships. Like maybe we, the whole world will be a Sri Lanka and then people will finally be open to the paradigm shift and say, wait a minute, we have, let's consider this other narrative of scientific narrative. How long do you think this might take? And will it require extreme hardship before people turn to it? Oh, I I do. I do see it shifting. I, I see it. I, I've been a big. If you if you'd heard me three years ago, I was saying the same thing I am right now. We are winning, and we're coming along. We are influencing people. I see it every day, every week, of people that just when they see the data that we have to present, their eyes get wide. They go, "I didn't know that. Why are we being lied to?" And, and that's that's the big. It, once we get this information in front of the right people, that's why I need to be silenced, and that's why my colleagues at the CO2 Coalition need to be silenced, because we make a lot. Of, not only make a lot of sense, we have a compelling argument, but right. mainly it's fact and science based. We can back it up with the facts, and we're being silenced because if that gets, if we are allowed to get our information out there, it's game over. It's game over for the alarmists. It's game over for net zero and it's game on for prosperity and economically driven uh, success here in America and around the world. What they want to do instead of putting their throwing sand in the gears of economic progress, uh, we need to, we need to get out of the way um, accept what's going on. Uh, we we can really, I think we can turn this around pretty quickly. But and I think people are waking up. This new movie, climate the movie, is going to be huge. Everyone watching this, write that down on thir on March twenty first. It'll be open. It'll be and you can go search for it. Climate the movie. It is compelling. Climate Top movie. scientists in the world talking about just what we're talking about here about how they they're silenced <clears throat> and how. If you're most of these gentlemen and ladies are scientists that are retired and they all talk about the same thing. I'm free to talk now. I'm not, a yeah. academia, you know, yeah, yeah. We, people, we young scientists that have walked away because they didn't want to be silenced. The only way we can get our grants is, is to throw in something about climate change. You know, if you're studying the sex life of yeah. Cambodian toads, <laughs> you have to, you got to, you, you have to throw something in about climate change, and then you get a grant. Well, and I hear that climate change has a disproportionate effect on the uh, changes from sitcoms to reality television. I hear that was a big deal, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, well I, I want to mention another organization too uh, that uh, yeah. we are both friends with, which is, uh, Cal Beister's uh, Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation is also doing excellent work. That's how we met uh, uh, Greg Wrightstone as well. Uh, if you're not on the mailing list of both of these organizations, you need to get on the mailing list because they both are doing an incredible job uh, of trying to get the word out there. So, You know, when I was, okay, 50 years ago, I was entering high school. I hate to say that, but it's true. Uh, at that time, I, looking forward to the year 2000, 
I should have been dead six times. I mean, between nuclear war, biological war, overpopulation, air, air pollution, water pollution, and then and hair loss. Hair loss, true. Well, that was going to be affected by the hole in the ozone layer eventually. Oh, okay. <laughs> which, which, now, people look back on the, that time and they say, oh, well, we've solved some of those problems. That's why you didn't die, Ron. We solved the air pollution problem. Now we can solve this one. I, I like to pick one of those problems. I mean, the hole in the ozone layer. Was it a problem? Would we all be dying of skin cancer right now if we didn't ban uh, uh, chlorofluorocarbons? What, what is your take on that? As a good scientist, I, I'm going to beg off because I, I, I'm not qualified. I, okay. I've looked at it, and you may know as much about it as I do. So I, oh. I don't like to talk about what I, I can't. I've got some ideas. I, I think that it may have been an issue, and it might have been because it's fluorine destroys ozone, and when it gets up in the atmosphere, it's it's a catalyst. For destroying ozone it does so in other words a catalyst isn't consumed it just catalyzes the destruction of the ozone and so it remains high in in the in, in the ozone layer and it's not so so it's, it continues catalyzing more destruction of odor, ozone without ever being consumed and it there's some st seems to be a relationship there uh but again i i i, I hate to talk about what i'm not yeah. Okay. I, I use the word expert. Fair enough. Because yeah. if somebody tells you that you're an expert, that they're an expert, you got to you should just, turn it off. It right just away. seems strange to a lot of people that we're not hearing about it anymore, and it was like it was never really closed. You know, we never we we didn't get closure <laughs> to borrow a word from a previous generation. Um, but I'll let you. I'll leave. I'll leave it at that. So yeah, thank you for that response. So, That's good. Right. That is very good. So uh, go to the website. Uh, you'll be putting up information on Climate Change, the movie, on the website, I'm imagining, in the next day or so. Yeah, and we'll be sending out a newsletter about it, promoting it. Yeah, we got it written down here. Okay. Um, that's, that's exciting. That'll be very good, and uh, we're praying that it gets a lot of play. Um it's, and with that, best, Ron, we're, we're getting best. some kind of feedback somewhere, and I don't know what it is. Well, I'm getting, I've got a lawnmower literally right outside <laughs> my window. It came along at just the right time. Uh, <laughs> it'll probably go away if we, if we stretch this out for another minute. <laughs> is that what you're hearing, do you think? It could well be. It's been a growing kind of a thing, and I was trying to figure out if it's here, but it's not here. I've taken it's off my headset. It could be dying out now. Okay. Well, it's about time to be heading out anyway, or we're uh, right at, almost at the top of the hour. Ron, would you care to walk us out of here? Yes, I would care to do that. Let's give credit to whom credit is due. Our resident cult leader profiler is Neil Before Me. Our wardrobe manager is C.L. Fitzhugh. Culinary services are provided by Chef Ham and Cheese. Our tinfoil hat provisioner is Justin Gates. Jehovah's Witnesses coverage comes from Armageddon and D. Opposer. Our Mormon Archives Manager is Polly Gummas. Our Liberal Denominations Bureau Chief is Lucy Goosey. Transgender Issues coverage comes from Ben Hur. Our Special Correspondent for Cults Based on the Hindenburg Disaster and Flying Turkeys, O. Oh, D. Humanity. Our Fact-Checking Supervisor is Yoleg Pulling. Technical Assistance comes through Morky Research. Our legal advisors are at the law firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. Our grievance resolution director is Yovana Pisami. Director of Privacy Assurance is Wiretapping. And original idea sourcing comes from Drew A. Blank. The Unknown Webcast is a production of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc. in cooperation with Emergency Manicure Productions, both of whom are solely responsible for this content, although you will never be able to prove that in a court of law. Never, never. At least it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> yeah, well, there's only the first time. Well, all right. we have, yeah. So, everyone, we will see you all next week. We're going to do something new and exciting, which I forget what it is. But it'll be good. <laughs> it's very exciting. <laughs> so, we're going to wave goodbye to everybody.